C.L. Warner's entrepreneurial spirit guided him from the family farm to Omaha, Nebraska. He began a hard labor job at a steel mill, but recognized his need for independence and a need to control his own destiny. Using his car as a down payment, C.L. bought a 1956 Ford truck. Because of the strict hauling regulations, and because he was only 19, he could only transport rock and gravel in the winter, grain in the spring, and produce in the summer. But nothing can slow Warner down. He began working around the regulations by purchasing the freight, hauling it to his destination, and selling it to the receiver. This way he was still hauling his own commodity. During just the second year of business in 1957, Seal's first son Gary entered the world. He would become the first of four children to help transform the family business into a billion dollar operation. Seal officially named his company Warner Enterprises in 1959. With the purchase of his first diesel truck, Seal began to see the future of his company unfold before his eyes. While growing a business, the young businessman was also growing a family. In 1959, Seal welcomed his second child, son Greg. Not long after, in 1962, his daughter Gail was born. In 1963, Seal landed his first major non-exempt commodity client, William T. Joyce Company in Council Bluffs, Iowa. They were frustrated with the unreliable railroad system and they struck an agreement with Warner. The William T. Joyce Company was impressed with CL's business tactics and trusted him with their business. This deal spurred a long and profitable relationship between the two companies, as well as giving Warner the ability to buy additional new trucks. He bought three brand new GMC tractors and grain trailers. Kurt Warner, CL's youngest son, was born in 1964. By 1965, Warner Enterprises had about a dozen trucks and nearly $550,000 in annual revenue. At this time, CL made the decision to stop driving in order to oversee the daily operations. He moved his company out of his 900 square foot home and into a little shop of property costing $25,000 in Council Bluffs, Iowa. CL's vision was growing into a successful operation. By the late 1960s, CL had another workforce waiting impatiently in the wings, his four children. Everyone began at the bottom pulling weeds and mowing grass. As the children matured, so did their roles in the company. Yell moved into a receptionist position and the boys gravitated to the shop. The transportation industry is not an easy business, but CL knew that with hard work, he can make Warner into the company he dreamed about. Those two pictures were from uh, breaking ground on the new corporate office in 1976. So in 1980 to 1985, uh, the current picture is of a uh, custom truck that was built in 1985 for CL Warner. Uh, this one right here is um, uh, it's one of the trucks that's in front of the courthouse in uh, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And then at some point for the, the 1980s, this is just a, a picture of one of the drivers coming in through one of the entrances. Talk about advancement in technology. The electronic log devices that many truckers use now actually started off as these things. Uh, these are the Qualcomm's. This is actually what was first tested out in 1992 uh, for logging the miles, making sure that um, anything was reported as far as out of route miles, uh, ETA plans, um, anything basically. This is the, the, the grandfather. Uh, of what we use now. And then in 1998, uh, there was a pilot program that was started. And then in 2004, because of the way that everything was working, um, Warner was given the exception to move away from running on the paper log books. Heading into the mid-1980s, Warner Enterprises was entering a period of tremendous gain along with great risks. Since deregulation in 1980, the trucking industry had undergone some major changes. Large shippers were beginning to consolidate their shipping. 
Instead of working with multiplicity of regional carriers, they began to look for larger trucking companies that could handle all their needs. At the same time, the national economy entered a period of rapid growth. Throughout the 1980s, interest rates remained relatively low, unemployment was under control, and corporate America fared well. The stock market responded to these conditions and rose steadily throughout the mid-1980s. It also created perfect conditions for entrepreneurs such as C.L. Warner who wanted to take their companies public. Unlike many of its competitors, Warner owned its own trucks and the company counted among its assets almost 500 tractor rigs, the average age of which was less than two years. The company's marketing department also commanded respect throughout the industry. Warner boasted a two-to-one ratio of trailers to tractors to accommodate the needs of high-volume shippers, and it worked closely with customers on multiple pickups and deliveries of partial loads. For all of these reasons, Warner Enterprises was a promising company in the eyes of investment bankers. All that remained was finding the right situation to introduce Warner Enterprises to the public. By early summer 1986, everything was in place. In June, Warner sold 2 million shares of stock on the over-the-counter market. The shares had an opening price of $17 and rose to $22 within the first three months. Using the money raised from the initial public offering, Warner also began to build necessary infrastructure to handle even larger contracts from national shippers. Now Warner could achieve economies of scale and drive down the cost of every load. This growth spurt was an exciting vindication of years of hard work for both Warner Enterprises and CL. In 1987, Warner Enterprises was named among the top truckload carriers nationally. In September 1988, C.L. Warner was named Chairman of the Nebraska Motor Carriers Association Board of Directors. By 1989, Warner Enterprises could begin to look back on a satisfying decade. The company reported an impressive 38% increase in revenue to $191.4 million, an income jump of 33%. By the end of the decade, Warner Enterprises of 10 years before would have been hardly recognizable. The company owned almost 1,800 tractors and employed 2,251 drivers and had facilities in Omaha, Ohio, and Los Angeles. Warner also leased facilities in Denver and Dallas. The company had recently bought land in both cities and planned to open new terminals within the next year. In 10 years, it had become a public company and one of the leading truckload carriers in the United States. For over 50 years, Warner Enterprises has been delivering unsurpassed services and dedication to customers. Warner's commitment to leading-edge technology and freight transportation innovation has allowed the company to grow from a small trucking company to a multifaceted premier provider of logistics solutions. Throughout its growth, the company has remained customer-focused and asset-backed. As the competitive landscape has changed, Warner has extended its service offerings and broadened geographic coverage to accommodate customers' needs worldwide. In 2006, Warner Global Logistics was formed to meet the demands of a world market. Warner Global Logistics became one of the first North American companies to receive combined approval to operate as a wholly owned foreign entity in logistics, trading, warehousing, ground transportation, and NVOCC services under China's new regulations. Shortly after, Warner Global Logistics opened its Asia headquarters in Shanghai, China. Global implementation has enabled Warner Global Logistics to manage freight for customers in North America, Asia, and beyond. Within the first two years of operation, Warner Global Logistics made a significant impact on the international freight market, serving over 60 countries. Warner Global Logistics' strategy to provide best in-class service to customers is achieved through significant IT investments, warehouse alliances, cross-site facilities, and alliance carriers, all supported by its U.S. assets. Warner Enterprises has aggressively advanced its infrastructure to develop optimal supply chain solutions and visibility, thus evolving its local service to offer a true global supply chain. This advancement has allowed Warner to offer the most efficient delivery solutions to meet and exceed customer expectations. The company is well positioned for future success and will continue to be the leader in freight transportation innovation. This is the one that CEO Warner had originally purchased to start the company. Don't worry, I'll give you an inside look here in just a moment. But compared to today, look at how simple everything is on this thing.